One of the things that us physicists find ourselves saying all the time is Einstein was right. His theory of general relativity is the best description we have for how gravity works. Everything from launching satellites into space to how planets orbit around the sun and how the sun orbits around the Milky Way and also how stuff moves around black holes. Every test we've put it through, it's passed with flying colours. So does that mean that we can all just sort of pat ourselves on the back and brush our hands of it and all go home because the job's done? No. We are still testing gravity. And crucially, we're coming up with different theories of gravity, which we could also test our understanding of in the hope of better understanding how our universe works. So let's kick things off with a little bit of a reminder of some science history. Isaac Newton is credited with the first explanation of what gravity is. That every single particle is attracted to every other particle in the universe by a force. And that force depends on how massive those particles are and how far apart they are. Newton wrote that down as a few equations and those equations allowed us to predict where cannonballs would land and how high we could throw a ball and even the orbits of the planets. Now, when those predictions were accurate, it became clear that this was the way that gravity was working, at least in our local backyard of the universe and in the physics labs on Earth, i.e. the places that we were able to test it in at the time. However, the planet Mercury threw a bit of a spanner in the works. Newton's equations didn't give accurate predictions for Mercury's orbit. So that suggested that his theory and his equations were flawed somehow. So along came Einstein in 1915 with his theory of general relativity. And I've talked before on this channel about how Mercury's orbit was actually one of the very first tests of general relativity. I'll link the video up here so you can go check it out if you want. Now the way that Einstein thought about gravity was very different to how Newton thought about it. Instead of just sort of this force acting at a distance, he thought of gravity as mass curving space-time. And here it's sort of represented in 2D, but really you have to try and picture it in 3D. That's just incredibly, incredibly difficult to do. Now, Einstein's equations that describe how gravity works look very different to Newton's. And that's because Einstein worked with something called tensors that actually appreciate the full four dimensions of space-time. So the three dimensions of space, so forward, back, left, right, up, down, and then also time. What the tensors do is mathematically describe how space is curved by an object with mass. You can take Einstein's equation and the full tensor form that it starts in, work it all the way through for Mercury's orbit, for example, and you'll get out something that actually looks very similar to Newton's equations. It just has this extra term. And that extra term is divided by c squared, the speed of light squared. Now the speed of light is a huge number. And if you're gonna take a huge number and times it by a huge number, you're gonna get an even bigger number. And so if you divide a term by such a big number, you essentially get incredibly close to zero. So in most cases, that term's just not gonna matter at all. For example, here on Earth, throwing a ball up into the air, that term vanishes to zero. And except when either the mass is very large or the radius is small. So for example, in Mercury's case, Mercury is very close to the sun, which is very massive, so it makes a difference. It also makes a difference around massive objects like black holes. And we were able to test that properly for the first time when we had that first ever image of a black hole back in 2019, thanks to the Event Horizon Telescope. Everywhere and every way we've been able to test general relativity, its predictions have been right. So everything from planet orbits to pulsars to black holes to gravitational waves, it's all evidence in favor of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Those equations that he came up with are thought to govern everything from the expansion of the universe to the behavior of black holes, to how gravitational waves move through space, to the formation of every single structure in the universe, from the smallest planet to the biggest galaxy to the biggest clusters. 
of galaxies. But what about the areas that we've not been able to test general relativity? For example, around bigger and more energetic objects, the entire universe perhaps, or on the opposite scale, the tiniest objects in the universe, such as particles, the quantum level. Do you guys just put the word quantum in front of everything? Does general relativity hold there? Well, we assume it does at the minute because of all the scales we've been able to test, it has held. But what we're doing is extrapolating there. We're saying because it works on the smaller scales that we've been able to test, it must work on even smaller. And because it works on the biggest and the most energetic scales we've been able to test, it must work on even bigger ones than those. But just like how Newton's equations work perfectly on everyday scales here on Earth, but then don't for other scales such as large masses and small radii, then you might also start to think, well, what if that's also applicable for general relativity? What if there's also some scales where you need that extra term, maybe, and you need to alter general relativity in some way in order to make accurate predictions. Now, you might be thinking, this is very interesting and all, Becky, but like, this is just speculation, so why should you care? Well, understanding gravity has huge implications for how we understand how the universe was formed, how it's evolving, and what it's made of as well. It's a branch of astrophysics that we call cosmology. With general relativity proven on all the scales that we can test it on, it's actually the problems in cosmology that I've talked about before on this channel about the current sort of crisis in cosmology that's going on that is actually driving forward the need for a slightly altered theory of gravity. If general relativity is correct, then it predicts that 96% of the universe is dark and doesn't interact with light. It predicts that dark energy makes up 70% of the universe and we don't know what that is. It's this mysterious force or energy that's acting against gravity to cause the expansion of the universe to speed up. Then the other chunk of the dark universe is dark matter. There's so much evidence for dark matter, it's just all gravitational in nature, i.e. We don't see it with our eyes necessarily, but we see its influence due to gravity. So all of those things, dark energy, dark matter, really do raise the question of whether general relativity that has served us so well so far in all the scales that we've been able to test it on is maybe not the full picture. It's not that Einstein was wrong, just like Newton wasn't wrong. It's just that in the scales that we're looking at, it just maybe needs modifying slightly. So there are currently astrophysicists in institutions across the world that are trying to come up with new theories of gravity and crucially, test whether they are right. And don't think like this is a new thing either. Like physicists have been trying to, you know, make general relativity better with some edits, you know, ever since Einstein first proposed it in 1915, you know, everyone from Eddington to Dirac to Sakharov. So like I said, the majority of these new theories are modifications or extensions to Einstein's theory of general relativity because any new theory of gravity you come up with still has to work as well as general relativity has on all the scales that we've tested it on. But sometimes people have been known to basically just crumple up everything we've currently got and throw it out the window and start from scratch, which... I'm sure that sounds overwhelming, as does trying to adapt general relativity as well. So how do people actually go about doing this? Well, here's three different ways. Number one is starting from an observation and working backwards from there. So for example, theories like MOND, Modified Newtonian Dynamics, have started with this idea that dark matter might not necessarily need to exist to explain something that we've observed. So one of the strongest pieces of evidence for dark matter is the idea of galaxy rotation curves. So the speed that stars are moving around the center of a galaxy. When we look at a galaxy, all the light is concentrated in the center, pretty much. That's where the brightest spot is. 
That's the same as what we see in the solar system, right? 99% of all the stuff in the solar system is basically the sun's mass. So when we look at what speed the planets are going around the sun, we see that speed drop off as we get further out. So we'd expect to see the same thing in galaxies, but we don't. That speed actually increases as you go out to the outskirts. And that suggests that actually, instead of the mass being concentrated in the center, there's actually a load of mass on the outskirts. But that's not where we see stars, so it's assumed there's lots of dark matter out on the outskirts of a galaxy. But that's all based on the assumption that general relativity is right. What if we had a different theory of gravity? Would that be able to explain these galaxy rotation curves? And so that's what Mon tries to do. It actually starts with Newton's equations not Einstein's, throws out Einstein's completely. And it actually says, well, what if we just added this extra little factor into Newton's famous equation, F equals MA. This factor though only matters for very low acceleration, the kind of numbers we only ever see for stars orbiting around galaxies. Then the speed that Mond predicts that stars should be going around the center of galaxies is exactly what we observe. But crucially, it also predicts what we observe for planets going around the sun as well. So it kind of seems to solve the problem of dark matter. The problem, however, is that it doesn't get rid of the need for dark matter entirely. You still need it to explain the masses that we see in, for example, galaxy clusters. So it started out as a theory to explain away dark matter, but it can't get rid of it entirely. It can only sort of reduce its majority percentage in the universe. But the biggest blow to Mond came in 2017, because what Mond predicts is that gravitational waves should travel at a different speed than the speed of light. But in 2017, we detected from the exact same object at the exact same time, a burst of light and gravitational waves, suggesting that they travel at the same speed. And that was a huge blow for that theory. Number two, adding an extra field to general relativity, i.e. you have a gravitational field that gives you the force of gravity, but what about if you had an extra field that coupled to the gravitational field to give you a fifth the force, as people know it, because we've got four fundamental forces in the universe and this could be one extra one that we haven't thought of before. For example, scalar vector tensor gravity, which I know is a ridiculous name, I'll admit, they add an extra field into general relativity that at very, very small distances produces a force that acts against gravity, sort of like a repulsive force to weaken it. But then at very, very large distances, it couples to gravity to actually make gravity stronger. So sort of in the middling ground from everywhere, from you know the solar system to black holes, to the Milky Way, to galaxy clusters, it reproduces everything that general relativity has been able to do. But it can also explain things on these big cosmological scales and for example, the galaxy rotation curves without the need for dark matter. But the problem with this theory is once again with the speed that it predicts gravitational waves should travel at. If you have this extra field that's coupled to gravity, it will slow down the speed that gravitational waves travel at. And as I said before, in 2017, we found that they traveled at the speed of light, i.e. the fastest speed there is in the universe. So that result back in 2017 really sent a lot of people that are working on all these different theories, not just this scalar vector tensor gravity theory, but all of the ones that try and add an extra field to general relativity back to the physicist's drawing board or blackboard, I guess. Number three, adding extra dimensions. Now people might have come across this idea before in the context of string theory. Now, string theory was a bit of a buzzword in physics for the past decade or two. It's actually a particle physics theory, one that attempts to sort of explain everything by getting rid of the idea that everything around us, matter is made of particles and saying, actually, it's made of one dimensional vibrating strings. Yeah. The vibrational properties of the string, i.e. how the strings vibrate, is supposed to give us the sort of properties of particles that we're familiar with, like mass, 
and charge. But crucially, what string theory also gives you is a theory of quantum gravity, i.e. how gravity behaves on the very small scales. It says that gravity is governed by the exchange of a particle, or actually a string, called the graviton. Just like how electromagnetism is governed by the exchange of a particle, a the photon, a, a photon of light, a particle of light. To work though, string theory needs 10 dimensions, not the four of space and time that we're familiar with. Now, it could indeed be that there are 10 dimensions, but on our scales, we're just not able to see them. But adding those extra dimensions has these huge ripple effects for how gravity behaves on small and large scales. Now, there are many, many problems with string theory, which is why you don't really hear about it that much anymore, because it's fallen out of favour with the majority of physicists. In the context of this video, though, about needing a new theory of gravity and explaining the crisis in cosmology, the issue with string theory is that it doesn't give you any explanation for dark energy and kind of produce any sort of repulsive force that could explain the accelerated expansion of the universe. And okay, general relativity doesn't give you that, but general relativity does a much better job of explaining everything else than string theory does. So our best theory for how the universe works is still one where general relativity is the best description we have of gravity because it fits our observations the best. The consequence of that is the prediction of the dark side of the universe. So if you accept Einstein's theory of general relativity, then you have to accept that dark matter and dark energy are things. But it's by no means a done and dusted topic. Like science never is. But that's the beauty of it, that our understanding can change and evolve over time as new evidence comes to light. And then new scientific theories that are rooted in that new evidence and also the mathematical understanding are then born. I, for one, am incredibly excited to see where the next century's worth of research will take us. First of all, thank you so much to you for watching this video. If you liked it, subscribe for more content like this and also hit that like button so more people who like watching space videos will see it. Second of all, a big thank you to my old office mate, Dr. Ollie Tattersall, who is an expert in modified gravity theories and he pointed me in the right direction to a couple of really good review papers on this topic, which I have linked in the description below if you wanna do like a really big deep dive into this. And then last but not least, a huge thank you to this week's sponsor, which is Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem solving website that gets you to learn by doing. Now, those of you who have been following this channel for a while will know that if people ask me, you know, I wanna be an astrophysicist when I get older, what's the best thing that I can do to prepare for that? I will tell them it's to learn to code. My language of choice is Python and you can find courses on Python on Brilliant as well as on sort of the fundamentals of computer science and algorithms as well. Brilliant teaches you to think like a scientist, breaking down problems into easy to understand chunks, but crucially having interactive sessions that give them like a fun application so you know how to apply the knowledge that you're learning. If you like the sound of that, then go to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and sign up for free. Also, just for you lot, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Sponsorships like this from Brilliant allow me to keep chatting science with you guys and for you guys to up whatever skills you need. So head over there to Brilliant and say thanks from me made of. It's a branch of astrophysics that we call cosmology. Cosmology. <laughs> That's what I feel like it did there. It's a little rainbow. Cosmology. <laughs> it's changed general relativity ever since Einstein first proposed it in 1915, including people like editing, ed, ed, editor, editor, no, editing Becky. Yeah, that famous physicist, Arthur Editing. <laughs> it's by no means a done and dusted, dusted? A done and dusted topic though. <laughs> Science never is. And that's the beauty of it. Blah, 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 blah.